Oh, good day, everybody. This is uh, Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to continue talking a little bit about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, uh, and more specifically about how we can use the the concept of the right and left shifting of that curve, and uh, the effects of a right shift and a left shift on uh, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, and how we can use that to kind of explain a little bit about how uh, we can uh, deliver uh, um, oxygen uh, to certain areas of the body. Uh, so what I have drawn here is a, is a very uh, highly simplified uh, version of um, the circulatory system, the, re the cardiorespiratory system. Uh, so here on the right, um, I have the alveoli. There's actually just an alveolus, but we'll just assume that there, uh, there are many alveoli here. Um, uh, and then I have this big circle here, which represents the, the circulatory system itself. And then I have a cell right over here. And so what I'm going to do is, and just, and again, we're going to be looking at the very big picture, um, not so much specific pathways for this video. So when we talk about the cell, what's going on in the cell? Well, I have cellular respiration, and I'm breaking down uh, glucose. Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, breaking that down and I'm tearing hydrogens off of it and um, I'm using those hydrogens to um, uh, to power, uh, producing a hydrogen gradient to, to power the, the protomotive force um, to, to power the production of uh, ATP. That's where most of our ATP is produced. Well, in the course of doing all that, uh, one of, one of the, the three main cycles that we talk about, the Krebs cycle, um, I have uh, my carbon dioxide being produced. Um, so my cell is producing CO2, or carbon dioxide, as a waste product. And we know that, that most of the CO2 in the body is actually transported in um, um, an ionic form. It is uh, converted to uh, bicarbonate ions and uh, hydrogen ions, and, and ultimately what that's going to do is, is CO2 is going to uh, decrease the pH. So let's say that I have this cell here, and, and this cell is working real hard. I don't know, maybe it's a muscle cell, or, you know, it's just a cell that's, that's working hard. It's, under, so some, it's undergoing uh, cellular respiration, and, and so the carbon dioxide is increasing in this the little, little area of the circulatory system here. Okay, so this, this cell is releasing CO2, and the CO2 um, in, in this, this area right here, we'll say, in this little area of the blood, the CO2 uh, is decreasing the pH, right? It's decreasing, so I'll just draw, the pH in that area of the blood is decreasing. decreasing. So decreased pH, which means that the uh, the acidity is increasing. Okay, so now what I have is while that's going on, I have this red blood cell here, and this red blood cell will say is fully oxygenated. Okay, the hemoglobin, all the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell has um, um, each of the hemoglobin molecules have four molecules of oxygen attached, and this red blood cell is going to circulate. It's circulating in this direction, we'll say. It's um, fully um, loaded, unloaded with oxygen. So right over here, unloading of oxygen occurred, and this little red blood cell has managed to make its way through. And the red blood cell just happens to pass through this area where the cell has kind of released all this carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide has made this area more acidic. And, and so the question I would give to you is, is what is going to happen as the red blood cell transitions uh, through this area? Well, if you, uh, you think back to the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, um, we have two uh, problems, or not necessarily problems, but we have two things that can happen. We can have what's known as a right shift, and we can have a left shift of the hemoglobin. And remember that left shift is um, all includes all the low things like low acids, uh, low temperature, low uh, two three uh, diphosphoglyceride or DPG, and a left shift is basically an increased affinity for oxygen or what we call a lock. Okay, 
I just think of it as hemoglobin is, is locking on to oxygen. Let me just uh, redo that here. There we go. It is locking on to oxygen. It's holding on to oxygen. It does not want to let go of the oxygen. Um, but now let's look at the right shift. And remember the right included things like raised acids, raised temperature, raised 2,3-DPG, raised a carbon monoxide, um, etc. And a right shift is a situation where hemoglobin has a decreased affinity for oxygen or it would rather release. Release the oxygen. Okay. So if we remember, one of the things that can right shift hemoglobin is a raised acids. A raised, raised acids. Well, what's going on in this area of the blood here? Well, the pH is decreasing because the CO2 is increasing, so the acid content, if you will, in that area of the blood is increasing. I have raised acids. So as this red blood cell transitions through this area of the, of the circulatory system, the hemoglobin on that right blood cell will become right-shifted. And what does that do? Well, if the hemoglobin becomes right-shifted as this, this blood cell moves through this acidic area, then that will cause the uh, hemoglobin in the red blood cell to release their oxygen. Okay, So the oxygen is then released, and it is now available to be used by the cell. And this process of the hemoglobin shifting to the right in the presence of um, acids, um, particularly at the cellular level, um, can be explained by something known as the Bohr effect. And I'll just spell that for you guys. It's B-O-H-R. This is the Bohr effect. And the Bohr effect is kind of an interesting effect. And uh, it's interesting in, in that um, it came from someone very interesting. Um, if you remember back um, to your chemistry classes, you probably talked about a gentleman, a Danish uh, physicist by the name of Niels Bohr, who uh, was one of the, the fathers of quantum theory and um, developed the Bohr model of the atom. Well, this Bohr effect was actually not... Um, developed or not thought of or not um, thought up of by Niels Bohr, but rather by his father, Christian Bohr, um, who was a uh, very famous and well-studied physiologist. So you can see that when it comes to the Bohr family, um, there was certainly quite a bit of uh, brilliance there, but um, this is known as the Bohr effect, and uh, this helps explain, at least in part, um, how red blood cells know, and I, I'll quote that, quote unquote, how does a red blood cell know when to release its oxygen? And it, it has to do with the fact that the, the, the increased acid content, the decreased pH in, this er in, in areas where cells are, are releasing CO2, um, shifts the hemoglobin to the right, decreases hemoglobin's affinity for um, oxygen in the red blood cell, and that, uh, that in part at least, that, that's one of the, the things that happens, um, allows the hemoglobin to uh, release its oxygen, and, and the oxygen can be used by the cell. Okay, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this video, and as always, thanks for hanging in there.